Welcome to Farming for Health, where Farmer Lee Jones and I talk with leaders in food, farming, and health and wellness to spread knowledge and inspire a plant-forward future, starting now. Welcome to the Farming for Health podcast. I'm Dr. Amy Sapola, Director of Pharmacy with an F here at the Chef's Garden. Today, I'm so excited to be joined by Leslie Brenner, founder and editor-in-chief of Cooks Without Borders. Welcome, Leslie. Oh, thanks so much, Amy. I'm so excited to be here. Well, I am excited to talk with you, and I love your work and what you're doing. And I'd love for you to tell your our audience a little bit about yourself and what really inspired you to get into this industry and to start Cooks Without Borders. Okay, great. Yeah, I've been in, well, let's see. Cooks Without Borders is an online destination for passionate cooks who want to explore the world and um, learn about other cultures through cooking. So um, I'm a longtime journalist, kind of an ex-journalist. I, I, I'm, I wrote, I think, five or six books about food and wine over the course of my career. I, I freelanced for um, lots of different magazines. I was food editor of the LA Times in the early aughts for four years. And mo more recently, I was restaurant critic and dining editor at the Dallas Morning News. Um, I, I left formal journalism um, a couple years ago, 2017, in order to um, in order to learn about restaurants from the restaurant side. And now I have, besides Cooks Without Borders, I have a restaurant consultancy that's based here in Dallas and doing work all over the country. So Cooks Without Borders, um, I found it in 2000, at the end of 2015, when I was still a restaurant critic and very much missing cooking, which I had done all my life. And some of the books I've done are cookbooks. And, you know, I ran the test kitchen at the LA Times. And I had really, really missed that part of my life, you know, dining out five or six nights a week. It's, you know, you're just not cooking a lot. So I, I, I founded Cooks Without Borders, um, actually came up with it the day that Donald Trump came down that escalator and announced that he wanted to build a big, uh, big wall between the United States and Mexico. And I thought, well, another way, another approach would be to, to start tearing down walls and building bridges and connecting people through learning about cooking culture. So that's kind of where the idea came from. And I just, I just love the idea that you can, you know, you can learn so much about another culture through, through cooking. Yeah. And I think it's fascinating how your experience kind of like your journey that led you to form Cooks Without Borders too. And being a restaurant critic, I think what an interesting job and missing cooking. I mean, that's something like as someone who primarily cooks at home right now with little kids, I'm like, gosh, that might be kind of nice to miss cooking for a little bit. But I think it's really, it's so interesting to think on the other side of what being a critic looks like. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? I think that's fascinating. Yeah, well, you know, people think it's extremely glamorous and there is a big, you know, a big part of it that's fun. I mean, if you like restaurants, you know, which I do, I love restaurants. I love, you know, I love the theater of restaurants. I love, I love hospitality. I just, I love the people who are in it. I, I love all of that and experiencing what somebody else wants to, you know, put on a plate in front of you is, is just wonderful and dining with friends and all of that. Um, but, um, and that's fun. But when you're a restaurant critic, you don't only go to wonderful restaurants, you also go to a lot of terrible <laughs> restaurants. And it's very hard on your body to be eating restaurant food that yeah. often. Because as you know, it's not always like, even if they're using great ingredients, they're, they're frequently using a ton of butter and, you know, like a ton of, you know, a lot of meats and, it's not the way I love to eat. So while it was super fun to do it for some years, um, now I'm back to eating the things that I like to eat, you know, very seasonal. Like I'm, I'm from California and grew up. Um, it's funny, I was thinking about talking, you know, thinking this morning about how I'd be talking to you. And I was thinking about my own personal relationship with gardens and my mom, who um, gave me a love for cooking, grew up during World War II and in New Jersey and they had a victory garden like a lot of people did. So, so she grew up, you know, when I grew up, it was all about fresh produce and we didn't, you know, she grew flowers in our garden, but we had a plum tree and we had a loquat bush and we had a persimmon, you know, so I was yeah. like, 
I was always like, what can I, you know, the idea of picking something from a tree or a bush and eating it to me, that was like the ultimate romance. Right. And so as a little kid, I would like, wow, I want more of that. Like, and I planted radishes and I would like pick them as they were tiny little, you know, so it's, it's something. And then, you know, living in California where the produce is, has always been just so incredible. Um, I was really, really fortunate to have grown up with that. Mm. And, and, and for me, and so for me, cooking is all about what's in season and, you know, what's, what's coming from the earth. Yeah. Who inspired you to start cooking? Um, well, my mom loved to cook. She, um, she was, she was a, a natural cook, um, but she cooked from cookbooks. She, you know, she learned from, you know, mastering the art of French cooking with Julia Child. And so yeah. she was doing stuff like that, you know, never wanted to deviate from the recipe. And my dad, my parents split up when I was like 12 or something and 13. Um, my dad, who didn't know how to cook at all, taught himself. And when my dad cooked, it was like happy time. And so I had this model of people who cooked. And my dad, like as he's teaching himself, he's just having so much fun. And I think that's where I really sort of understood that it's not all about the result. It's about enjoying the process and having fun with it and being around friends and chopping things up together. And, and like, I just can't think of anything more enjoyable. Oh, I agree. And that's that theme of connection, I feel like is coming up more and more, especially like in these current times, like how do we connect with other people and come together and enjoy a meal? I think there's nothing like I crave more than that. A note from our sponsor. Farmer Jones Farm provides nutritious, regeneratively grown vegetables to home cooks nationwide. We seek to provide our community with vegetables grown in a way that's healthy for you and good for the planet. To learn more about Farmer Jones Farm, visit FarmerJonesFarm.com. I'd love to hear from you more about like that connection piece and how Cooks Without Borders is creating that. Well, um, I think, you know, it was kind of interesting because it... Um, I, I had decided to kind of refocus on it um, right before COVID, like like a month before COVID, I had flown up to Northwestern Massachusetts where our, my wonderful designer, who's my oldest friend in the world, Cooks Without Borders design partner, Juliet Jacobson. And we sort of had this powwow about like, let's take, let's take it to the next level and figure out where it's going. Um, and then a month later, we were in COVID. And, um, you know, stuck at home and not being able to connect with people, which was really, really hard. Um, I was fortunate enough to um, my husband and I had our son temporary living with that temporarily living with us um, when that happened. So we were like really lucky because he stayed with us for like a year. Um, and, and he was and, he, you know, he and he's kind of a beginning cook since then. Like he got really, really good during COVID and we really, really connected um, it was like just the best thing for all, you know, for our relationship to, you know, just be stuck cooking together. Um, it was really, really wonderful. And then his girlfriend actually came and stayed with us and we got to know her that way. But we were really like in this little microcosm with the kitchen and cooking and, and it was really wonderful. But and then at the same time, um, developing Cooks Without Borders in a way like how can we meet with people? How can we bring other people into this? So we started sort of a, a video series where we um, brought on people, um, you know, in, in a chat like like you and I are having right now. Um, we did a series of six of them with people, um, cookbook authors, chefs. Um, one, one is a purveyor of heirloom corn from, um, from Mexico, who's based in California. And we brought everybody, you know, we did these sessions where we, um, you know, we do like webinars that the, the pub, they're actually on, um, you can find them on Cooks Without Borders and they're really, they're super fun. So I felt like, you know, okay, like at least we could make that connect, those connections that way. Um, so yeah, we've been doing that and, you know, took a little pause from the series, like, as people got, um, you know, people got a little bit of, of video fatigue. And, and I think, I think there's maybe now interest in it again. So I think I'll probably restart those. Yeah. One of the things I love, um, that you write about cooks without borders is it's for people who geek out on cooking. Um, and that you, 
and those who can think of nothing more delightful than spending a whole day in the kitchen, the, and chefs and cookbook authors and passionate home cooks, as well as for young people who are starting to fall in love with cooking. First, I'd love to ask you, what would you say to those people who feel they don't really have time for cooking, right? Who can't even imagine this like whole loving it piece. What do you say to those people? Well, I always, I always kind of feel like, you know, if, if you, if you can reheat something in, if you have the time to take five minutes to reheat something in the microwave, actually, there's tons of things that you could do that would be actually cooking. And cooking isn't always about, you know, sometimes it's just putting things together that, that are wonderful together, whether it's, you know, I mean, it could be a million different things. I, you know, like I keep, I stash things in my pantry that are wonderful that you can just like put out on a plate, like some, you know, some white asparagus and some, um, you know, I don't know, like just a little smear of mayonnaise and you dip some bread in that. And, you know, so like cooking doesn't have to be a major production is, is, is one thing I would say, but also like everybody, everybody doesn't love it. I mean, my husband, I've been married for like a hundred years to a person who doesn't cook at all. Um, and he doesn't, you know, he doesn't enjoy it. He doesn't get, it. he loves to eat what I cook and he's happy to clean up, but he's never going to be a person who loves cooking. And I, you know, and that's okay. That's okay. Everybody doesn't have to, but yeah. those of us who do really do. Yeah. Oh, I think that's great advice. And I think it, it like, it's a nice balance between someone who loves to cook and someone who doesn't, but will clean because not everyone <laughs> who loves to cook loves to clean. Right. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> um, when it comes to pantry staples, I think that's something that can really like be a game changer for an up and coming cook or someone who's interested in cooking. I know you mentioned like having some white asparagus and some mayonnaise. Are there other like little things that you just keep around that are like a go to on those days when you're not really into cooking a lot, but like just simple, simple things? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, some of it, some of it is just like normal pantry stuff. Like, of course you have mm -hmm. to have like olive oil and I mean, if you have garlic and olive oil and vinegar, like you can turn any leftover into a delicious, um, like, like any leftover vegetables, you yeah. like you know, together, you put a vinaigrette on it and it's a, it's a little salad the next day. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, but I don't know, I love, um, I always have like, tubes of harissa like that like I I don't feel okay if I don't have harissa <laughs> in my pantry <laughs> um I have um um oh boy that let's see I how have how do you like to like, use harissa I should ask how do I like to use it yeah um I like to um oh just like a squirt in it of anything that tastes a little bland that has anything approaching Mediterranean flavors and it's going to be great oh yeah um so, and things like, you know, like condiments, like, um, um, oh, of course my brain is giving up on me that the Japanese condiment that's like sesame seeds and nori and, um, togarashi. Yes. Called, um, it's like, if I went like that, I could probably grab it. Um, I know, <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking about and I can't think of the name right now either. <laughs> um, or, you know, Dijon mustard. I mean, yeah. I, we were in France last summer and there was a shortage of Dijon mustard. And I came back and started buying all the Dijon mustard I could find. Like I have like, if you need some, like I should start a mail order business because, um, you know, the idea of like not having it like really scared me. Yes. Oh my gosh. Some people had toilet paper and you had Dijon. Right. Yeah. And tomatoes. Oh. I mean, I don't like to be, you know, like right. and if, if you keep things like that and then you have some some, you know, like there's always like leftover, like there's always just vegetables in my fridge. Like you can always whip something up and yes. pasta, dried pasta, like then you can, and a hunk of Parmesan, then you're like, you're good to go. Right. Yes. I mean, you can do anything. That's I such... also keep a lot of crazy things. Like I have, like I have frozen dashi, like, Ooh. you know, the, um, the Japanese stock. Mm -hmm. uh, so I know I have like vegan versions and, you know, the regular version made using bonito flakes and, and kombu and like, if you keep things like that, like I could make miso soup in five minutes because I, because, because I always have tofu and I keep that. Yeah. So, yeah. I think there's really something to that, to building like that basic kind of pantry, like build around the flavors that you like and you enjoy. Um, but having those easy grabs and the go-tos that add so much flavor to whatever is in season. When it comes to kids, that's the other part I wanted to bring up. Um, 
is really what are your thoughts around children and getting them into the kitchen and inspiring the passionate cooks of the future? I think, I mean, I'm, I'm really, yeah, either I did something right or I'm really lucky because my kid loves to cook and he's a really good cook. He just loves it. But, you know, from when he was little, he was born in New York city and we lived there till he was four and we would, um, you know, we would take him to the farmer's markets. I think, I think giving kids an access either to a garden or a farmer's markets, talking to them about, you know, like when they meet the farmers and that's the guy who grew, you know, who grew those potatoes or who grew those, um, you know, grew that arugula or, you know, wh whatever it is. Um, and, you know, again, if they could, if they can be in a garden, take them to pick strawberries in strawberry season, you know, take them out in a strawberry field. And if they can make that connection between what they eat and the way it's grown, it's it really, really exciting for them. Um, when, when my kid was little, we, he had one of those little toy kitchens we had gotten them, you know, like this ridiculous plastic thing that's, you know, a couple feet high. And he would just spend hours like pretending to cook so that he, you know, for him, like play cooking meant that cooking was aspirational, Yeah, and, you know, and his father who doesn't cook, I remember one time I was away and they decided to make bread based, based on some TV show they were watching. And <laughs> You know, they were both beginners, but I got home and they had made this beautiful bread. And so just like letting kids play in the kitchen, I think um, makes it sure that they won't be afraid of it or, you know, mm -hmm. won't people think that cooking is a chore or some pe people who don't love to cook think that cooking is a chore. And if if you make cooking fun for your kids and let them be part of it, like like make 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 Chinese dumplings with your kid, you know, buy some wonton wrappers or dumpling wrappers. It's really easy to make a filling and then show your kid how to fill it, you know, how to make the, how to make the dumplings. Like that's like playing with Play-Doh and what kid doesn't, you know, doesn't love that. They, I think they all do. Oh yeah. And I feel like it's so good. Like the sensory and tactile experience of cooking for kids and the creativity like the color the creativity the flavor it's really engaging all of their senses so I couldn't agree with you more when it comes to um, having been a writer and a critic and a consultant and so much more you've had such an amazing career what do you really see as the future of like vegetable forward cuisine well, I'm really, really, really pleased at what I'm seeing lately about um, how people have been embracing this kind of cooking. And I think, you know, I heard a really interesting show on NPR the other day. It was an interview um, with a with a vegetarianism psychologist, philosopher, or something, um, an academic, and you know, and they were talking about um, they were talking about being you know, being vegan or being vegetarian, not all the time. Mm -hmm. And that's something I've always been really attracted to. I went to um, like the first time I, when I was 15, I decided, okay, I'm going to be a vegetarian. Like, just like randomly, I don't, you know, like this is, this was a long time ago. It was in the, I guess I was 16 in the seventies. So 15, 16 um, in the seventies. And it wasn't like, it wasn't the thing it was now. So it wasn't yeah. as easy, and it, you know, but I just wanted to do that. And um, you know, I did it for like a year and then I got tired of it because it was like really hard to do it in those days. But in the nineties, um, I went to India. I was able to visit India and I was really amazed talking to people how, how some people, some people I met would say things like, um, oh, I'm eating vegetarian today. So I'm going to, you know, have, you know, some spinach, you know, whatever. But they think of it like, oh, today, you know, today's going to be a big vegetable day for me. You know, like they treat meat as something that, that you just don't always have to do. Like mm -hmm. maybe you do it sometimes, maybe, maybe never, maybe. Um, but that idea that it could be this sort of more fluid thing that that's not as um, regimented and cut, you know, not as, as kind of... Um, you know, rigid, mm -hmm. um, that you can, it's a really good way to think about just starting to eat more like that. And when I was working in an office, you know, like before pandemic, <laughs> before pandemic brought me home and made my office at home, um, 
every day for lunch, I would eat vegan, um, you know, because I was pretty much eating, you know, at my desk or like running out and buying something. So I'd always have, I'd always have vegan at lunch. It doesn't mean I would be vegan all the time, but that was just a way for me to, um, or, you know, so like in the summer, it would be, you know, wonderful salads that you can just get off a salad bar. Or um, in the winter, I'd make these really big soups, um, these big vegan soups that I like to kind of eat all week. And actually on Coops Without Borders, there's um, I, like, I've, I've done the recipe so many times that I wound up doing a recipe, a master recipe called um, Sunday Super Soup. So it's cool because it's because you kind of use whatever you have, you know, it starts with like, you know, just like some aromatics, onions and carrots and stuff like that, that you just kind of sweat in a little olive oil with. Um, and then you kind of either go like the herbal route, like if you want to take it in the Mediterranean direction or could be more of an Asian root if you want to go more like ginger, you know, kind of some of the more Indian spices and you could spice it however you want. It's it's ba it's kind of based on lentils, which mm -hmm. I like my favorite, you know, they're one of my favorite foods and ancient food. Um, you could use any kind of lentils and and then and then and then vegetables. And so for vegetables, it's like whatever you have in in the in your crisper drawer is going to work great in this soup. And then if you have some leftover vegetables, you can chop those up and throw them in at the end. Or if you have some, you know, salad greens that are looking a little tired, but they're still good, you throw those in, you know, I'm always throwing like a handful of arugula or baby kale in at the very end. Um, and then it's just like, not only does all, all that nutrition go in there, but it makes it, you know, it gives it these beautiful dark green streaks and, and it just, it's, I love the soup. I make, you know, I, like I eat it constantly, like the minute the temperature drops, I'm like on the, all over that soup for oh, months and months. That's, this is, this time of year is the best time of year for warm soups and stews. And I do, I agree with you. They're so nutritious and so just satisfying. I feel like they're the best way to cook vegetables. And if you have meat in them, great. You know, either way, I think it's a really nice way, like you said, to enjoy what's in your refrigerator or what's in season. And I also love that you talk about recipes kind of as like a guide, but not as a, a rule book, right? And so having that guide there, but then giving people the permission to say, hey, put in what you have, put in, you know, whatever is in season or in your fridge. I think that's such a nice way to be able to cook and allows for so many more possibilities. It's also, it's also nice because then like, it's so easy not to waste food that way. If you have yeah. a destination for that stuff, that's like still good, but on the way out that you wouldn't want to like serve as a salad necessarily, but, um, but still good food. That's such a good point. And something we're really passionate about too is like, how do you eat root to leaf, right? And how do we reduce food waste? And I think that brings up such a valuable point of being able to just toss it into a soup or I, a lot of times, like even food scraps, um, I'll put into the free in a freezer in a bag and make a stock. And it's just, you know, all those little things add up. Yeah. Yeah. So um, when I look at Cooks Without Borders, one of the things that really caught my eye is you have food organized um, or you have things organized by um, course and also by food culture. And one of the food cultures is actually vegetarian and vegan. What was your thinking around doing that next to cultures like um, Mexican, Chinese, Indian, French, and so on? Well, I think it, it you know, because because it it has started to feel to me, and well, you know, I'm I know I'm pretty late on on, on seeing this, but like it does feel like a culture, right? I mean, right. Um, I you know, and people, you know, people have rituals around it, and and people, you know, feel passionately about it, and it is kind of a type of cooking. So, I you know, it it actually happened because I started thinking like. You know, I know so many people who are um, interested in in you know plant based plant based eating and plant based lifestyle and like and I'm wondering if I should like somehow tag those recipes or whatever. And then I just started looking at them and I thought, wow, I have so many of them. And I guess it's because that's really the way I like to eat. I mean, mm -hmm. don't get me wrong, I have tons of fish and meat and chicken things and shrimp and like all kinds of all kinds of um, foods are represented, um, you know, as they are culturally, but, um, 
I, I think simply because I'm so attracted to them, I, it just kind of suddenly made me understand that like, oh, wow, there's actually a wealth of that here. So I'm just going to put them in their own category and let them kind of live on their own. And that way, you know, I also think it's a way for people who um, identify as a plant based lifestyle person or a vegan or a vegetarian or, you know, however you want to describe that. I think it's I think it's just kind of nice to see like, oh, look at look at this bounty and none of what I have. Like I just like I've never been interested in like in meat substitutes. I don't think I've ever tasted an impossible burger. Um, I've never um, I just because I, I always feel like the vegetables themselves are so delicious, like just let them be vegetables um, and they're, you know, you know, I could go, I could, my, my husband couldn't, but when I'm by myself, I can go for days at a stretch without eating meat. And so, you know, it's, I don't need something to be pretending that mm -hmm. it's, and, and so I, th I think it's just a really nice collection of, um, of vegetables yeah. and plant-based. I mean, sometimes there's butter in them, some, you know, I mean, like what, what whatever it is. And then I, I label them vegan or vegetarian, you know, just to sort of help. And, and a lot of the time there's instructions like, oh, this is a dish that has some shrimp in it, but you could instead use, you know, just like double up on the, what a, you know, on the Brussels sprouts and, uh, you know, just a dumb example. Cause I don't think I would put shrimp with Brussels sprouts, but. <laughs> well, that's, it makes me think back when I first met my husband, I was vegetarian and he wasn't, but you know, I would often cook I would cook the base of whatever I'm cooking. And then if you want to add meat, go ahead and add meat, right? And so I I always kind of cook that way. And it's it's a lot easier, I think, than people maybe think. Um, and just at this weekend at the market, I was talking with people about um, the holidays are coming up. And they were talking about being really nervous that like a vegetarian or a vegan was coming over and like what would they feed them. And I think – to your point, like there are so many recipes that have vegetable as the base that can be adapted very easily and taste so good and delicious that you don't even necessarily miss like the, the meat component, yeah. um, but that are very nourishing and satisfying. And I love that you have a whole section on that. As far as like um, pulling recipes from these different cuisines, how do you get the inspiration for the different recipes? And do you work, how do you work, like find the different chefs and um, what's your process there? Yeah, well, I mean, the inspiration comes from different places. Sometimes mm -hmm. it comes from, um, sometimes it comes from cookbooks, like, or um, like, I don't know, like, okay, for instance, during, um, you know, during lockdown, during COVID and like, I, I crave all kinds of cuisines, right? So like, yeah. like one day, you know, like I was really craving Thai food and I couldn't go out and get it. And it wasn't really in my wheelhouse to cook it. So I, you know, researched like what's, what are the best Thai cookbooks? And then I study them and I start cooking from them. And, and, and then you go, oh my God, like if you are cooking from a great cookbook, um, you can really, really, really learn a cuisine. Like I felt like the Thai food that I was making in, in not, you know, didn't take too long to get there was at least as good as some of the places that, you know, Wow. like you, like you really can like, and, and there is a value to being able to riff on recipes and stuff. But when you're learning a food culture that you don't know, so that you don't know, maybe you've eaten it in restaurants, but, um, if you really follow the instruction, like I would say, don't start riffing. Don't start riffing until you really understand it. Like my son was would always be like, like, oh, you know, that Thai curry you're making is good, but I would have used some chicken broth where you're using, you know, entirely coconut milk. And I'm like, yeah, but that's not what they do there. So like, let, you know, and then he, you know, and then he would try it and he was like, it just doesn't have the right taste. It just doesn't have the right taste. I'm like, well, you know, like they've been doing that that way in that culture and they've developed that cuisine and that's why it tastes that way. So, yeah. So I, I so sometimes it's from cookbooks and I try um, very, very hard to, to, because I think, I think in general, the best recipes out there are from cookbooks. 
-hmm. That said, there's a lot of unedited or untested or poorly tested or shoddily edited cookbook recipes. Um, so one of the one one of the things that's most important to me to do on Cooks Without Borders is find the great cookbooks and review them and put them out there and give some sample recipes. Sometimes even those sample recipes need to be tweaked a little bit, but it's like, so it's curational. Like I'll help you find the ones that are really good. And if you cook from these, you're gonna feel the way I did when I found that book after trying five other books that didn't do it for me. Um, so that's um, so that's one way. And then sometimes it'll be like, you know, I'll talk to a chef um, and work with the chef closely until I understand something. And that's, that's um, I, I've learned a lot fairly recently from a chef here in Dallas named Olivia Lopez, um, who has a, um, a, a really interesting small food business called Molino Oloyo, um, very focused on heirloom corn. And um, I learned a ton from her. And she's actually the Mexican cooking, the Mexican cuisine expert on Cooks Without oh, Borders. Wow. So um, some of her recipes are there. And, you know, so sometimes we bring in chef to do things like that. Oh, I love that. And I think knowing that you're kind of vetting the books ahead of time is so helpful as well. It's one of my favorite cuisine, I would say, between Thai and Indian. They're probably like Thai, but um, it is hard. Like, I, I don't know where to start. And so to have those cookbooks already vetted is awesome. And to be able to think that there's even that possibility of being able to cook for a while from the cookbooks and get comfortable enough. And that's what I often say is like, I might make it at home, but I, you know, I'm not like that comfortable with it. And so I think it's exciting to think there's even that potential. <laughs> It really is. I mean, I'm glad you brought up Indian cooking because I love Indian cooking and I always have. And yet I feel like the Indian cooking that's at, like I live in a community where there's um, a huge Indian population, population of Indian immigrants. Mm -hmm. um, and yet there are very few, if any, really good Indian restaurants. And that's and it's kind of cultural. It's because um, people in India um, with money generally don't cook. They have people who cook for them. And so the people who are winding up in the United States, winding up emigrating, um, often they don't have those skills. And so the people who are opening up restaurants here, maybe they were an, an engineer, maybe they were, you know, but often they weren't actually somebody who learned to cook. So you can get a great Indian cookbook like Julie Sani's book. And, and if you really follow the recipes, you will say to yourself, oh my goodness, this is the best Indian food I've ever had. It's really, it's stunning. It's really, really stunning. Oh my gosh. I'm going to buy that. <laughs> I'm like, I know what's on my Christmas list now. Yeah, I, also, I also love um... a message from our sponsor. The Chef's Garden is a family-owned regenerative farm that grows the most flavorful and nutritious vegetables, herbs, and microgreens for culinary professionals and home cooks. For over 30 years, the Chef's Garden has supplied some of the world's finest chefs and restaurants. Now, through Farmer Jones Farm, the same delicious ingredients are available to home cooks in the United States to use and enjoy, delivered directly to their homes. The Chef's Garden mission is to grow exceptional vegetables, care for each other in the land, and to inspire a vegetable forward future. For more information, visit chefs-garden.com. Oh, Vegetarian India, Mother Joffrey's book. Ooh. Yeah, I'll show you. Yeah. You'll enjoy it. This one is really great for vegetarians. Oh my gosh. I will definitely have to try that. That's, yes. I have, yeah. Oh my gosh. That's, I love cooking so much. Um, and I think having the spices too is another thing. Being able to kind of build your pantry around um, some of the basics. And when it comes to like, um, cooking other cuisines. Are there some pantry staples you have just like generally if you're going to be cooking without borders? Like are there things across cuisines that you find helpful to have on hand? Yes, that's a great question. I think um, speaking of spices, if you mm -hmm. have whole coriander seeds and whole cumin seeds, that's really useful. And if you just toast them in a pan and then grind them, you need a mortar and pestle. Um, these are not as difficult. To, I mean, you know, 
And and this is, you know, and this is really like the pleasure of cooking because if you just like stick those dry spices in a pan and toast them for a minute, just until you can start smelling them and then you grind them up, the aromas that, you know, your kitchen suddenly fills with are so gorgeous. And that's, to me, that's the pleasure of cooking. It's like the smells and the sounds and the, and the feeling of crushing the spices. And it's like, if you can get, find pleasure in that, like you can have a happy life, you know, because it's not, it's healthy. It's not going to hurt you. It's, it makes other people happy. And um, so, yeah, so spite whole spices like that, I think, and, and also whole spices, you know, keep way better than ground spices. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can use them for any recipe, even if it calls for ground spices, you just grind it up. Um, so that's wonderful to have. If you're rich, you can have some saffron on hand. A pinch of that is, um, is good and a lot of wonderful and a lot of things. Cinnamon, um, nuts are good to have. Oh, oh, another cross-cultural thing is whole chili peppers of different kinds. Um, you can make, you know, grind them up and make moles. You can make Thai curries. You can make, um you know, different Indian sauces. There's, you know, all kinds of things you can do with, with, with dried chilies. Um, Yum. All of those sound so good. And I do, I think it's such a good idea to have those staples and dried chilies. I mean, those keep for a long time. Do you uh, have any favorites as far as dried chilies go? Um, I like, um, I don't know. I like the little chiles de arbol. Um, and I like, um, I like ancho. I love ancho chilies. Yeah. And when you buy dried chilies, I don't know, it's, it's only fairly recently that I understood this. If you can get your hands on dried chilies that aren't too brittle, that are, you know, a little, a little softer and fresher, um, they're just, they're better. Oh, um, oh and That's you can make, really her, you can make harissa out of them yourself. If you have yeah, and, and, and like some caraway seeds and dried chili. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's another cool cross-cultural moment. Oh, yum. You. And I then there's some... also, I'm sorry. Oh no, go ahead. I was just going to say, I have some rose harissa and I love using harissa, but I've just recently gotten into it. So that's why I'm like, your love of harissa is inspiring. <laughs> oh, and you can put harissa in that, in that Sunday super soup. Like that's, that Ooh. takes, you know, a little, a little hit of harissa is nice in there. Um, but yeah, no, I was going to say then there's also, there's also some fresh things that I keep that are cross-cultural, like um, cilantro, you know, mm -hmm. is, you know, is, is in tons of Mexican dishes. And then it's also in, um, you know, Vietnamese and Thai and a lot of Chinese dishes and a lot of Indian dishes. Ginger is very cross-cultural, garlic. Um, so yeah, th those are some of those them. Those are great suggestions. When it um, when we talk about like vegetable forward cooking at home, what's your favorite dish right now to cook at home? Mm, well, I love sweet potatoes, and one of my I have two favorite ways. One of them is just like and 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 I love the sweet potato that I love is a garnet sweet potato, and Ooh. it's really um, the flesh is really kind of um, dark and rich and almost like buttery and sweet. I, I really, really love that. So what I love to do is just like really roast it until it's like seeping what looks like caramel oh, um, yeah. in your baking dish and then just eat it plain. Like to me, that's like a real treat. If I want to be fancy, I take, um, I take some white miso and some butter and let the butter get room temperature and just like mix equal proportions of miso and um, and butter, mix them together to make like a, a miso butter. And then you just slash open that sweet potato and put miso butter in there, maybe some like scallions on top. And oh, yeah. uh, so good, like all through the, all through the cold months. I, I love that. That sounds delicious. I've never done, I've been reading about miso and butter recently. I read about, um, it was in Cook's Country or one of the magazines just recently had a, a toast that was miso and butter and then like a pickled carrot, um, just like a quick pickled carrot on top of that. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I have to try this. I why I haven't thought of miso and butter together. But yeah, 
sounds delicious. Yeah, I love quick pickles. And like, if you have a lot of like cauliflower, like sometimes I just buy a cauliflower because like you never know when you're going to need a cauliflower. Um, but like you can always like put it in that soup or make quick pickles. Like if you have some, you know, if you keep mm -hmm. things like it, like carrots and cauliflower, like you can always do a million things, right? And those are both like super cross cultural also. Like pickled cauliflower exists in how many, you know, in how many different cultures? Like, a zillion. Oh, yeah. And it's a great way to preserve it too. That's, I love looking at different preservation te techniques too, um, across cultures. So yeah. And add so much flavor. I think that's wonderful. So our podcast is called Farming for Health. When you hear of Farming for Health, what does that bring up for you? For me, that brings up, um, well, you know, the, it brings up the obvious of eating from the land is 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 just going to be healthy. But I I also I'm also very concerned about the health of the land. So it's like farming for health. It's about our health, and it's about the health of the planet and the health of the land, and also the health of communities. So when farms are are tended in a way that um, nurtures the earth that's good for the planet and it's good for, and it's good for humanity. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm thinking in particular about, about heirloom corn mm -hmm. and um, what corn farming has done to our country economically and chemically, like the pesticides involved are mm -hmm. really frightening and, and horrible to me. Um, and when I think about what that type of farming has done to Mexico and Mexican culture and destroying traditional farming communities um, because of, you know, commercial, um, you know, industrial farms that have been there, like, you know, all through the last century um, that that was developed. And, you know, I, I just really love these small, like, sin, um, sin maíz, no hay país, without corn, there's no country, that, that grassroots movement that's going on in Mexico um, to sort of bring back that kind of small land race farming and the communities that are around it. And, you know, you start taking those pesticides out of the equation and we just have a better earth that, that's more, more nurturing and, and that can give us better food in a better way. Um, so that's, that's what it means to me. I love that. What a beautiful description. And I, it just makes me think of really what regenerative is, right? You take away those pesticides and allow the land to regenerate. And I think then we're all nourished from that. So I think that's a beautiful description. Um, so I know our audience is going to want to connect with you. Where can they find you online? They could find me at cookswithoutborders.com. That's awesome. the best place. Great. Yeah. And I highly recommend checking it out. You have so much content there and it's really wonderful. Thank you so much for being a guest on the podcast today. Amy, thank you so much for having me. I'm, you know, I'm a huge fan of Chef's Garden and, and I'm so excited to have been on the podcast and um, it was wonderful to hang out with you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Farming for Health. We hope that you enjoyed this episode. Connect with Farmer Lee Jones and I on Instagram and Facebook.